Hello? Can you hear me? Good. Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to implementing anti-patterns, aka implementing cross-namespace resource ownership in Kubernetes. Uh, I hope I won't disappoint you uh, with this talk. I know I will disappoint you with it being an anti-pattern and implementing it in Kubernetes. And I hope you're not too disappointed by that. So what we're going to do today, um, I'm going to talk a bit about some Kubernetes concepts um, that we usually use and we usually see like uh, ownerships, dependence, namespaces, um, garbage collection, and uh, the rules that goes with those concepts. Uh, then we're going to try to exploit and uh, implement and do some forbidden stuff that uh, Kubernetes disallow in the documentation and in the implementation as well. Uh, and we're going to try to do so without smashing through the walls of Kubernetes implementation. We're going to bend the rules so it fits our, uh, our very anti-patternish wrong use case uh, that I'm going to, in the meantime, try to justify to you uh, so you see that we really need to do something like that. So first things first, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Tom Tsofal. Uh I work as a software engineer at Red Hat uh, at the Office of the CTO in Emerging Technologies. Uh, what do we do? We research uh, various topics. Uh, we experiment with managed services, open services, and things like that. And one of our um, key area of focus is analytics, data science-oriented uh, workloads, and uh, things like that. So, that's where this use case originated from, um, and I'm going to talk to that a bit later. So what I'm going to be talking about, there's a very nice coincidence. Uh, yesterday, there was this book signing event at the Red Hat booth. I didn't know about that before, beforehand, so I've added the slide in the last minute, um, about Kubernetes pattern, patterns book uh, by colleagues of mine at Red Hat. Honestly, I haven't read this book. Uh, if those authors are here, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sure it's a very nice book. Uh, and since I haven't read it, uh, I'm going to be doing anti-patterns. So we're going to shoot the deck, and uh, we're going to smash through it. No! What just happened? Good. So how we're going to do it, uh, this is the agenda. As usual, first we're going to start with introducing some concepts to you, uh, going through the most basic stuff for most of you maybe, uh, but also going to some, some more advanced things. Uh, so hopefully uh, it's not just a recap and we will get some, some new connections between those concepts. Then I'm going to provoke you with the use case. Uh, and then we're going to explore only one solution because we don't have time for more and really uh, we've come up with this one solution, so we implemented it and, and we used that one solution. Uh, we can save that for the later Q&A or other discussions uh, with beer or something, um, why this implementation may be wrong or uh, how, how to do it properly. Then, um, as a fourth point, we're going to implement it. We're going to see how much effort is it to implement something like this. Um, and Last but not least, if the time permits, we're going to do a live demo with our project uh, that is running um, somewhere in the cloud. Uh, so hopefully networks will be kind with us and it will work. So first concept that I would like to introduce to you is hopefully not very new to you. Uh, how many of you here intentionally uses Kubernetes namespaces on their clusters? Great, everybody knows what a namespace is. Awesome. So just to recap what Kubernetes documentation says about namespaces. It serves 
for isolating groups of resources. And then the documentation talks about namespace-based scoping and cluster-wise resources. So that gives us some information that there are two distinct types of resources in Kubernetes, that we have something namespace scope, and then we have something that is shared across the whole cluster. This is a very important uh, thing to remember that we can use two types of resources. And there are a lot of things that comes with, with, with those different types. Um, there's security and RBAC constraints that comes with uh, cluster-wide resources that uh, out of blue you have access to all uh, namespaces in a cluster. On the other hand, if I have a namespace-based resource, uh, I can have a resource with the same name in a different namespace, and now I have with two people talking about the same resource with the same resource name in two different namespaces, they are talking about two different stuff. Uh, so that's also an interesting uh, topic or interesting point to remember that we have two, two things uh, happening there. When to use namespaces? Well, usually in environments with many users or distinct workloads that I want to separate and isolate, right? Common knowledge. Um, so far, so good. So another point here is that each Kubernetes resource, if it's namespace scoped, it can live only in one namespace. So we can't have a resource spanning multiple namespaces. It can be either cluster scoped or a single namespace. Good. And last but not least, what Kubernetes documentation talk uh, um, says about namespaces is something called resource quota. This is a very interesting and important concept with namespaces that comes with namespaces. So, resource quota. Again, I'm quoting the documentation. This is something I've learned from implementing this thing. Read the documentation. That's what we usually don't do when we're hacking stuff and putting things together. Uh, so, that's why I'm quoting on a second slide. I'm, Again, quoting Kubernetes documentation. So, resource quota, what does it serve? What purpose does it serve? Well, we want to ensure that each distinct user group, each distinct namespace in cluster gets its fair share of resources. That we can't have a single namespace consuming all the resources in the cluster, eating it all, and there's no resources left for another team. So we can set some boundaries, upper boundaries, what's the maximum amount of uh, resources one team, one namespace can consume. So that brings us to multi-tenancy. Um, I don't know about, about your use cases of Kubernetes. Um, our use case is mainly running long-lasting clusters with huge footprint tens of nodes, even, better, even, even more, uh, and hosting multiple teams that we want to keep isolated on those clusters. So we have user team A and team of users named B and many others, and each of them have access to multiple namespaces, or can be one, can be more, or can be tens, uh, based on their need. And we want to isolate those. So we do that through namespaces, we do that through resource quota, we do that through some RBAC on top of it. Switching gears, owners and dependents. Uh, one last, one last uh, topic to introduce to you uh, before we jump into, uh, into the real stuff. So owners and dependents, also a very well-known Kubernetes concept, right? The most obvious uh, chain of owners and dependents that everybody uses is a deployment replica set pod. So deployment owns replica set, replica set owns a pod. If I delete uh, deployment, replica set gets deleted, pods get deleted. Very, very common, uh, very common, uh, pss, mm, workflow. Um, and this is something that is used across Kubernetes in many various uh, formats and ways. Um, so this is how it looks on uh, 
on the API side of things, uh, on, on the manifest side of things. You usually don't uh, define uh, a manifest for replica set. You usually don't define a manifest for pod. So these are usually very hidden from the end user perspective. They create a deployment manifest and are happy with it. Everything else is orchestrated by Kubernetes for them. But these own references are still present in those YAML files, YAML manifests, JSON manifests in the cluster once deployed. So I can take a look into a replica set and see there's a metadata field called own references that is referencing the deployment. And it contains identifier information, it contains unique, unique ID, kind, name, API version, but also two other flags that are used for, uh, for uh, additional control, additional uh, stuff on top of it. So there's uh, a flag setting a controller, uh, setting which resource actually controls uh, the, uh, the, the dependent because you can have multiple owners for a single resource. So you want to avoid them fighting over this resource. So you have this control flag that uh, it can be set only in a single own reference. Then you have a flag for block owner deletion. So uh, this is telling the garbage collector how to behave when uh, this resource is being deleted or when the owner is being deleted and how to, how to handle those situations. Then we have another concept that is kind of working hand in hand with owners and dependents. That's finalizers. So you don't have to specify an owner or a dependent in finalizers, but finalizer needs to be clever enough to determine these relations. Usually you see that in persistent volumes and persistent volume claims where you can actually start deleting a persistent volume claim or persistent volume even if it's mounted to a pod. The, pod, uh, the, the persistent volume, persistent volume claim will still stay in terminating state until the pod gets deleted. And this is ensured by the finalizer. As you can see in the manifest for persistent volume claim, there's no, uh, no owner definition, no owner reference that this pod owns this persistent volume claim, but still the relation is maintained. So when it comes to regular owner, uh, owner references and ownership of resources in Kubernetes, we can have these things, right? These metrics. I can have a, a cluster scoped owner, again, going back to namespaces and those resources, those two distinct types that I've talked before, that I can have cluster scoped and namespace scoped resources. So I can have an owner, which is a cluster scoped resource, and I can own a cluster scoped dependent. Again, comparing apples to apples. Good, that's that's normal thing to do. What I can also do from a cluster scoped resource, I can own a namespace scope resource, which we see as like a small subset, narrowly scoped resource than the cluster wide one. Okay, good. Then I can ha I can have I can't have a namespace scoped owner owning something on the cluster scope. That kind of breaks through these isolations, right? That's also a very obvious thing to, thing to have. And then I can have, in the top right corner, I can have both of them namespace scope. Well, can I? It, you can, but they need to live in the same namespace. Um, Kubernetes will allow you to define the ownership reference to a resource living in a different namespace. It will allow it. It will, the API, the admission control will accept it. And then the, uh, the Kubernetes controller will come in and start uh, working on it. So what will actually happen are these issues. What's going on with uh, my resources? What's going on? What's happening? Uh, I have 
I have a resource that is owned by something and this resource is just out of blue deleted by the controller. What happened? Well, what happened is the controller goes into my resource that is owned by something, goes through the own references, looks through the own references and sees I have this namespace scoped own reference and it doesn't exist. Okay, there's out of sudden, there's no owner. And I'm a dependent resource. I'm a dependency of something. I'm generated from something. So I'm ready to be garbage collected. I'm ready to be deleted and just delete this resource. So you define across namespace ownership. Everything's great until there's time for the garbage collection to kick in and it just deletes your resource without any warning because it feels that this is a legit thing to do. So if I go just really quick back here to those own references, you see no namespace field in it. You see name, kind, UID, and flags. So it really doesn't uh, convey the information that there's something to be happening with namespaces. So we get those issues. Um, what's happening to, with my resource, my post getting deleted, and also articles about these are the lessons I've learned uh, and by skimming uh, Kubernetes documentation, and these are the things I really shouldn't be doing. So beware. Okay. Since version 1.20, of Kubernetes, we get this nice notice in the Kubernetes documentation telling us, don't do this. It must exist in the same namespace. Otherwise, the garbage collection will kick in. Beware. So this is what we're gonna implement. It's, dis it's disallowed by design, and we're gonna try to bend Kubernetes. Why? Well, okay, we have some extra stuff on the right that should be there. Um, well, we have this operator. That's what you see on the top. Uh, and we have a cluster scoped operator, a controller that's working on the cluster scope level. Normal thing, everybody does that, right? And we have namespaces. We have users in different namespaces. So we deploy something, some custom resource into various name namespaces. This is called in our project, this is called Meteor Shower. Um, and this resource is holding some specific generic configuration for that particular instance of Meteor Shower deployment. Again, imagine it as a Kafka cluster uh, custom resource or something like that. We can generate additional resources from this Meteor Shower within the same namespace. So, there's a Meteor resource, which is part of Meteor Shower. It's owned by Meteor Shower. And this is a very normal relationship. Again, deployment replica set pod. Similar relationship here. I have a Meteor Shower, a Meteor derived from it, and some workloads, pods generated from it in the same namespace. That is, that is fine, that is good, that is normal thing to do. Well, then I have a problem that I want to solve because for some reason I want to generate resources in different namespaces. I want this operator to be able to integrate with external services in different namespaces. Well, why? Uh, in our scenario, this is a data science project that needs to integrate with legacy uh, additional applications deployed to different namespaces. And I want those namespaces with resource quota. I want it self-contained and isolated. So we have one namespace where we are running build pipelines for uh, data science um, repositories. And this, is, this should have different quota than deployment of some data science workload. It should live in a different namespace. And I also want to support multi-tenancy. I want to support multiple instances because I have multiple teams on my cluster. So I can't have my shower instance cluster scoped because I want more instance of, instances of it. Uh, that would solve the issue, right? I would have cluster scope owner of all the resources, fine. I can't have that. 
well, what do I do? Uh, what do I do now? I can't just set the ownership reference to that other namespace that would just delete my resources. Why would I want to set ownership references? Well, this is simple. We don't want to leave garbage. We don't want to leave mess after ourselves. So if user leaves and deletes their workload, deletes their meteor, I want to be able to garbage collect from other namespaces. I don't want to leave images and um, image streams, which we know in OpenShift, um, left in those other namespaces. So I want to be a good steward, uh, good guy, and clean the cluster after my usage. So what do I do? Well, the solution we came up with is to provide a resource called Meteor Coma, uh, which is a mere shadow of my Meteor in those other uh, namespaces. Then I can define the ownership reference as a normal thing within a single namespace. So Meteor Coma in namespace F owns all the, all the pods in namespace F, and this is a normal, normal relation. Now, instead of syncing ownership references across multiple namespaces, I just need to ensure that I have uh, Meteor and Meteor commas side by side in the namespace, and I need to ensure that they both exist at the same time, and I need to synchronize their creation, their deletion, and passing of the ownership references. Fairly straightforward solution, but it's an anti-pattern. So. This is the API uh, or the resource definitions that we came, with, came up with. Uh, just custom resources, Meteor, and Coma resources, and it defines a couple of fields in it. So, first thing is an owner reference in Meteor. That's the standard thing, right? This is owned from a shower called Perseids in the same namespace. It's an ownership reference, so if I delete my Meteor shower, I can be sure that this Meteor gets deleted as well, so it's not left behind. The other thing here is a finalizer, and this finalizer is here to ensure that if I'm deleting a Meteor, I will also query or schedule for deletion all the commas. Then, in status, I track all my commas in all the namespaces, all the external namespaces, as something like an ownership reference, which is understood only by our custom controller, uh, but it's there, and it has additional fear for, for, for a namespace. Um, so um, this way I know that there's this additional resource in the other namespace. It's pointing to the comma, it has the same UID, it has the namespace name, and kind and stuff like that. So in my comma, I also need to set a finalizer to ensure that the comma is not deleted until somebody deletes the meteor. Because I don't want all the resources in the other namespace just disappear uh, if somebody's doing stuff in that namespace. I want to wait until they intentionally delete the meteor. And just for good measure, I also track the owner in here in comma just for redundancy and to know uh, where to look at if I'm doing something with the coma. So we have this pattern of all referencing everywhere and uh, so far, so far it seems good, but how do I implement it? What do I do with it? Uh, well, if you think, of, think about it, it's not that easy. It's not an easy problem to solve. Uh, if you think of creating resources for you through kubectl apply or, or something like that and manually creating all references and, and getting those UIDs and everything right, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and if you do it wrong, the resources get deleted because they don't exist. So the kube controller is very strict about that. What we can do, what we can use is our Golang binding Let's go for the Golang SDK and uh, have fun with it and try to implement it through Q Builder and operate it through Operator SDK. Uh, this is 
this was our solution, or this is our solution, how we approached it. And it's turned out fairly simple for such a complex problem. So first, the, uh, the, the finalizer. What do we do in the finalizer? Well, it turns out that this is just a few lines of code. So if I, have a del uh, if I don't have a deletion timestamp, the resource is not being deleted, so I need to ensure the finalizer is properly set on those resources. Standard thing to do. I need to add it to the manifest. I need to update it, update the resource. Good. And if the resource is being deleted, I just query all, the, or I just schedule all the commas to be deleted as well. And then if they are deleted successfully, I just remove the finalizer so the resource can be deleted. Well, what do I do when I want to delete all those commas? Again, very simple, very simple single for loop. I just list, I just walk all the commas that I have in my status and just schedule them to be deleted. Simple. Well, when it becomes more complex is uh, actually synchronizing the creation. But our operator acts, watches the CR creation and acts upon it. Watches Meteor being created. So we just, when we are creating Meteor, we just list all the external service services we need to integrate it and loop through them. And then it's all the same. It's just, do I have a namespace for that external service? I do, okay. So I get that namespace. Do I have access to the namespace? If I do, I can create comma in there. So I create a comma in there. And I just do some, on the right, I just do some extra magic with own references and setting up those names, generate own references and set them for my tracking in the status field, which is, again, fairly simple. So now, this is all the implementation that I had to do. I've implemented the creation of all the commas across all the namespaces, and I've handled all the deletion phases. This was all the code. This was all the implementation. Well, now I need to deploy and test and run it. So we use this community called Operate First, where you can get for community workloads, you can get free infrastructure and deploy their workloads in there and uh, operate it and collaborate on operations and on SRE related stuff and things like that. So we use it as our, uh, as our uh, go, -to, go to community for, for uh, Kubernetes and OpenShift and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, we deployed it there. So let's take a look at it. This is our uh, Meteor instance. It provides you a way how to get, uh, this is unrelated to the talk, but uh, this is the use case being explained. Uh, so we automate away from a data science type of Git repository to images being deployed to Jupyter Hub and uh, other, other, other ways. So we get some meteors in here uh, that are being created. And, and if you like fill in uh, this form, pass the URL, that what happens? There's a meteor resource being created on a cluster. So we can take a look what actually happened in the cluster. I have a meteor resource, as you can see, managed by Perseids. It's owned from a shower resource. I can go into the manifest and I can see that there's an own reference for Perseids shower. And it has some spec and it has some commas in, in, in its status. So it's integrating with some other namespaces. So I can query uh, for, well, yeah, I can query for Meteor and I can query for comma. So I can see I have quite a few meteors in this namespace. And this is my meteor that we've been just looking at. And I can take a look at 
a different namespace at the other namespace that uh, I'm integrating with as the external service. Now, I don't have any meteors here, but I have commas, and they are named the same, so I can, uh, just for consistency, they are na named the same. So comma really does nothing as a resource. It's a, it's a blank uh, shadow of the meteor that we can use to own the additional generated resources and garbage collect them afterwards. So if I take a look here now into builds image streams, in this namespace, I can query for this name. There's an image stream which is, which is owned by this coma. Uh, so this image stream, which is an internal OpenShift resource to hold images in their internal uh, OpenShift um, image registry uh, that is internal to the cluster. It has some tags, it has everything, but what's important here is there's an owner reference that we've added to this local coma in that local namespace. What we also have for this meteor in the other namespace, we have built pipelines that are uh, run that are run against this meteor, against this meteor spec. So again, it's owned, managed by uh, this meteor. So if I delete my meteor, which we can do, if I delete my meteor, what should happen is that I'm going to duplicate this so we can see it. Uh, all these, all these pipeline runs and all these image, this image stream should be deleted. And as you can see, they are living in a different namespace. So if I delete this meteor, the controller, yes, the controller should delete those pipelines and delete the image stream. And just to be sure, uh, we can take a look at this namespace and get those commas. Yeah, I shouldn't be having it here. Yeah, it's not there. The comma gets deleted as well. So it worked. It did its job. And it was a few lines of code. So if you have a complex use case, if you have something that is hard to solve, well, if you think about it and go into QBuilder operator SDK and um, really try to implement it through the Golang SDK, it's really easy to do, to bend the Kubernetes rules and to implement, it, implement something that is really, really disallowed and really uh, advised not to do in 20 lines of code. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, now's the time. <laughs>